Namaskar. Good afternoon from the cool interiors of the conference room of the Bihar Museum in Patna. I welcome all of you viewers to the Bihar Museum Biennale 2021. Today is the second and the last day of the two day virtual engagement of the conference, Bihar, India and the world, connecting people, connecting cultures. We had a wonderful sessions, sessions yesterday. We began India time, 2 p.m. and we continued right till quarter to nine, the sessions, and it was a very, very well attended session for each panel. Of course, we had the keynote in the early part of the day, Neil McGregor spoke beautifully about museums, civic sense, uh, the public engagement, a huge amount of ideas which he did, which you can all see on YouTube if you log on to the YouTube from tomorrow onwards. But coming back to the present, I want to really welcome my three very dear friends who are on the panel. It's interesting that these are three people I seem to know forever and ever in my active professional life. Three people who come from three different trajectories and I'm happy that we included it in this way because uh, whether it is Pramod KG or Ashok Adisian or Dr. Reema Huja, who are on the panel today. I will, of course, be introducing them formally a little later. Uh, but in an informal way, I want to say that all three of them come in from three different trajectories into the museum space. And that is what is going to make this panel really interesting. As you all know, the title of this panel is Viewership, Connoisseurship, Outreach in a Post-Pandemic World. Now, viewership, connoisseurship, and outreach has been happening in the museum space for uh, a long, long time, ever since museums were constructed and erected in a modern world. Whether they were Ajayab Ghars or Sangrales in India, or wonder cabins or cabinet of curiosity in the West, the museums have been going through a long sea of transformation from being museums which housed only antiquities or things which were completely outdated when you spoke in a way and said, put them in the museum. They've become extremely interactive spaces, spaces of debate, spaces of ideas, spaces of uh, human emotions, and actually have become laboratories of ideas and spaces of uh, interaction and intellectual discourse and debate as well, while also being spaces of popular culture. There are museums of indigenous art, museums of historical antiquities, museums of memory, museums which are deeply political, museums of the haptic, of the touch. So I'm not going into that kind of discourse. This one hour is very, very limited to how connoisseurship, outreach, and viewership is undergoing changes in the post-pandemic world because the pandemic has made us virtual. Like today, it should have been in a physical space had it been what we had proposed for the Bihar Museum Biennale in 2020. At the same time period, we would all have been physically here today in Patna, in Bihar. But look what the pandemic did. We are all here virtually in the Museum Biennale space, but we are all uh, Pramod is speaking from Delhi, Ashok is speaking from Paris, Reema is speaking from 
uh, Jaipur. So we are in one place, but yet we are all linked only virtually. So the number of there's so many questions that how has the pandemic impacted the audience, the patron and the connoisseur? How has the pandemic impacted the distribution, engagement and consumption of culture? And what are its re ripple effects in the post pandemic world? Um, what is the future of engagement and outreach of museum cultures? How is Rima going to reach out to people from the Savai Mansingh, uh, the second museum. How is Ashok going to deal with outreach in this post pandemic world where there is still neurosis and anxiety about meeting people physically? How is uh, Pramod going to look at his, you know, the key work that he does of archiving and his curatorial practice where there is going to be less and less physical engagement. Um, I'm now going to introduce, and I think I'll just go by alphabetical order, my dear friend Ashok Adisiem, who is Director of Global Strategy and Institution Led for the International Saint Raphael Art Institute in Grand Paris, School of Art, Design, Media and Creative Minds to be launched in 2022 in collaboration with the Ecole de Beaux-Arts Nantes. He was director of, of international and public affairs at the DAG in India. He also served as director of Institut Francais and Alliance Francaise in Paris, Nigeria, India, UK and USA before specializing in the conduct of art museums. So Ashok comes with a, you know, a huge um, uh, experience of dealing with museum cultures and art practices in different parts of the world. Dr. Rima Huja is an archeologist, a historian, a teacher and a writer. Rima has a PhD in archeology span from Cambridge University and is currently director of the Maharaja Savai Mansingh Second Museum Jaipur, director of the Jaigarh Public Charitable Trust, vice president Ecomos India, trustee Maharaja Ganga Singh Ji Trust Bikaner, managing trustee Jaipur Virasat Foundation and visiting professor at School of Planning and Architecture Delhi and at Ahmedabad University. So Rima comes in with another kind of experience. She comes in through the experience of art and archaeology and also looking at the um, kind of design practice which goes into the museum. Pramod KG is managing editor of ECA and he was the founder director of the Anoki Museum of Hand Printing at Amer, Jaipur. He directed the Jaipur Virasat Foundation and instituted the Jaipur Literature Festival. He's form, he is a former lecturer and a published author with contribution in several books, journals, and magazines. And until recently, he was the editor from India of the Textiles Asia Journal. So you can make out from this, you know, fabulous uh, panel that I have, uh, how they are going to be dealing with museum culture in a post-pandemic world. So uh, Ashok, may I ask you to uh, do the honors and uh, do the Sri Ganesh, as we say, of uh, starting not only your presentation, but the panel today for the next six hours that we are going to be uh, talking about museums from the Patna, uh, from the Bihar Museum in Patna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pandey. Thank you very dear, Alka, uh, for having me with my, uh, with my friends here. I listened yesterday to the, to the debate. I'll follow everything today. And first, let me allow me, uh, in the name of my colleagues, also to congratulate you, especially, but also all the team of the Bihar Museum Biennale and also the, the chairman for having put this together, for first of having thought of it, <laughs> and having put this together in our uh, situation. Uh, putting the museum at the center of our discussions, I think, yes, indeed, as citizens, but also as professionals, uh, 
uh, we are very much engaged. You've been talking about public engagement. We have been uh, civically and professionally engaged all our life uh, since since 20 years, not only the three last years I was in India, uh, uh, to co-construct with a whole ecosystem, uh, uh, a very evolving uh, notion of the museum. So in my presentation, but uh, I would like to focus uh, in order to, to open the debate on, as you pointed out, and as you've noted, connoisseurship, which I would call scholarship, uh, which would allow me to speak about my actual project, but which is very much in the same sense of uh, public, uh, public engagement. Um, I would like to react, yes, I would like to react in uh, what you have uh, just mentioned about Neil McGregor and his uh, uh, presentation and his word, his keynote yesterday from uh, as the ex-chairman of uh, the British Museum, talking about civic sense uh, in the museum, public engagement, we have uh, uh, spoken about it, which for me resonates as public sentiments. Uh, uh, I've learned a lot, uh, including thanks to Pramod, uh, during my time in, in, in Delhi, the last, the last three, four years, uh, about the Ras, the Rasas, uh, about your codification, the Indian codification of art. And I love this word of public sentiments. Uh, which is drawn out from uh, history, history of art, and which is again uh, carrying us all in our in our in our work as professionals in the field of art and museums. Uh, this brings me to a second point, which I wanted to 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 note is public ethos. And with Alka, all these years we have been talking about the public ethos, which are engaged in everything we do in our ecosystem. If we are uh, working in a museum, if we are working in a private foundation if we're working on ga in galleries, uh, if we are an art critic, uh, and in any case, uh, if uh, and when you are an artist, public ethos is something which is always there uh, in, in, in what you do because you engage, and once again, I'm gonna come back to, to scholarship, when you engage with a public institution, uh, even if the public institution is private, but when it's what I'm saying, what I mean is when it's open to, to the public. Having said that, uh, I would like now, next please, to uh, introduce to you for the first time, this is exclusive because we're working uh, on this, nobody else than the, than the, the VR Museum Biennale is, is getting this information. Uh, it's very new, as you know, I, I, I left India uh, for personal reasons with my family uh, uh, last, the last six months and we have been working very hard with the Ecole des Beaux-Arts de Nantes to create something new as a result, again, of the pandemic and what it has been teaching us all and to prepare the future. And as far as this project is concerned, the Saint Raphael Art Institute, which is basically Ecole des Beaux-Arts Grand Paris, and, when, and I will show you later on a, a map of Paris and Grand Paris, uh, we are concerned and working on the artist of the future. Uh, the artist of the future, who, uh, I hope, will be exhibited in the museums of the future. So all this is, is totally linked within the same ecosystem. So in this post-COVID world, uh, which is like a post-war world, higher education, ideas and actions for engaging with creative ambition, uh, uh, we are here to invent a sustainable future. So what we have been doing, and you can see this, I don't know if you can zoom, uh, what we have been doing with Pierre-Jean, my partners uh, from the public system, but also from the private sphere, backed by, 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 by the ministries uh, involved, is uh, creating a university campus, which is uh, uh, pluridisciplinary in its essence with, with fine art and design, media and communication. And in our content, uh, we're gonna get the best faculties uh, to work with, with our students coming from the world over on diversity, on gender equality, on social change, climate change, inclus inclusive cities, borders, migration issues, digital technologies, of course, uh, art and health, talking about the pandemic, uh, and of course, museum creation. Everywhere in the world and uh, in Patna, you are a model uh, for the world. Uh, your museum built by Maki is a model for the world of um, what a city, a state, a government 
can create for its citizens and, and, and what impact it can have uh, in all these domains that we have just uh, now mentioned. Next, please. Next, thank you. Uh, our starting postulate uh, is that the artistic impulse and creation are key vectors for changing beha behaviors of a, of a society and thus the ecological and digital transitions that the world is uh, making. Hence the mission of the Saint Raphael Institute in the city, which is called Ivry, in the Grand Paris, uh, which are to create an economic and social urban local development project. And you can see that uh, architecture is very much uh, engaged in this uh, in the city with these uh, social housing buildings created in the in the eighties, very cutting edge, and at the same time very generous. Uh, and very visionary because it has, uh, you know, this ecological uh, uh, impact. Next, please. Uh, in, in its heart, uh, cultural and educational hub uh, with a worldwide dimension, we hope, uh, will be our, um, our, um, our, our foundation. We, we want to foster an ecosystem that accelerates uh, creativity in the global knowledge economy uh, and the knowledge transfer. And we are launching this international, as I said, interdisciplinary campus, uh, creation, science, climate change, social issues at its core uh, with a user-centric user university education uh, focused on the students' projects and dreams. Next, please. Uh, this is not, this is where we want to be. This is what, this is our benchmark. This is what we want to become. Uh, this is the Shanghai power station of art, uh, a former industrial uh, power um, electricity center, which has been transformed into a fantastic museum, which, which holds the Shanghai Biennale, your counterpart, Alka, in, in Shanghai of the, the, the VR Museum Biennale. Uh, and which is a which is a, a public uh, city museum on the river banks of Wangpu in Shanghai. Can we come back in the previous uh, to the previous to the previous slide? So this is Saint Raphael. Uh, it's a building which produced in the 1930s an alcohol which is called Saint Raphael, which still exists, and uh, uh, which hosted the University of Jussieu, Paris Five Sorbonne, uh, for a few years recently and then became again a, a, a co-working space that we are with our partners taking over 10,000 square meters. Half will be dedicated to the school, the, the, the Beaux-Arts uh, school with an art center of uh, 1,000 square meters. And the, the, the other 5,000 square meters will be a space where we're going to um, welcome universities from the world over, including I hope India, uh, say, for instance, the National Institute of Design, Ahmedabad, who can host uh, throughout the year, who can have an office and a space for its own uh, students, uh, like a campus, like an international campus office for them, uh, from China, from um, Japan, the Gedai in uh, Tokyo, from um, Seoul with the K Arts. Uh, and of course, uh, we're going to work with all the uh, next, please, next, and next, these two. Again, yes, we're going to work with all the museums, of course, which are in Paris and all the academic partners in Paris. So just for you to see <clears throat> on, in the map, uh, Paris would stop at the yellow line RRC, where you can see the, the, that's the railway station. Uh, Paris is on your left-hand side. So around this is called the Grand Paris, which is basically the, the very close suburbs. And this building is on the riverbanks of the Seine. And if you follow the Seine, uh, you would see that we are in a cultural, fantastic cultural hub with an, an art center, which is called Credac, with a cinema, uh, with the Inalco, which is the national institution for uh, Longzo. I, I guess you have heard about this, Longzo, the institution of uh, uh, Oriental uh, Languages and Civilizations, which is uh, more than 100 years old, so it's already a very international hub oriented to, 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 Asia, uh, oriented to Asia, 
you have the Beton Salon Art Center, you have the French National Library, uh, which is like 15 minutes from, from where we are. You have this fantastic digital French tech campus called uh, Station F with a lot of, uh, with a lot of uh, researchers and, and young students. And you have, if you continue a little bit, the National uh, Museum of National of, uh, of uh, Natural, sorry, uh, History, the Institute of the Arab World. Um, you have the Cartier Foundation on your left, and the Giacometti Institute, with which we worked in in, in India. Uh, you have the Opera Bastille, the International Cité des Arts. So all this is like twenty minutes, fifteen minutes. Notre Dame is twenty minutes uh, uh, metro from. Uh, the Beaux-Arts, uh, Grand Paris, uh, Saint Raphael Art Institute. Students from India, universities from India are on our top priorities. And it's not just because I, uh, of my Indian origins and my Indian friends, it's because India is the country, the space, and it's not Pramod who's going to say the contrary, uh, where you have uh, so much to share, so much to bring to, to us, in, if I may say, in Europe. So we are uh, creating this platform to prepare that future uh, with, with, with the youth, uh, students, young artists, young scholars. And we, we hope that mixing this uh, uh, in our platform of, of creation with uh, the same youth from China, from, uh, from, from Japan, from Korea, from Australia, uh, which would be like 80% of our, of our students, we hope, and, and also our faculty, uh, with the next 20%, which would be Europeans, then we are creating very concretely, as we know, encounters are, and, and like us, are uh, at the heart of our work. We are preparing the future within this context of, I would say, the post-war period. Everything has to be reinvented. Uh, we have to reinvent ourselves. And that's also, sorry for this personal uh, word, that's the reason why, why, why we came back here uh, to the place where, where with my family we, we, we have been raised to reinvent with what we are, with, with what we have done to, to be part of this reinvention. So I'm very happy uh, uh, Alka, that you're giving me this opportunity to reconnect in what I'm doing now with what I've uh, just recently been, been doing and with what we have always been uh, sharing in our projects and discussions um, together. Uh, to conclude very, very briefly, and I hope we'll, we'll have a, an interaction, the Saint Raphael Art Institute, can you share the next, uh, the next, if there's any? No, there's no. So we may come back to the first, the first page two, yes. Uh, Tomorrow's the question. This is an artwork, by the way, of uh, Rirkrit Tiravan, uh, Tiravanja. Yeah. Uh, you know it. <clears throat> the Saint Raphael Art Institute will be a place for training, creation, research on today's art and, and design in the face of the world's uh, major challenges. Uh, our objective is to occupy the first place among the most environmental friendly uh, uh, higher art schools. <clears throat> the same uh, goes for the issues related to diversity, parity, uh, parity, you say parity, uh, and, and solidarity. We want to be a multidisciplinary grande école with art, design, media, and communication. We'll be delivering state diplomas, uh, French state diplomas, uh, with co-degrees with its partners of higher education, for example, art and technology with the best uh, Institute of uh, uh, Technology in, in, in Paris. Um, and we'll have a very interdisciplinary and diploma courses, art, digital design, oceans, art and oceans, uh, art and digital technology, art and health, art, science, techniques, etc. Uh, it will be, we hope, a place of production of knowledge with a lot of research, with theory production. I would like to invite, and I'm inviting him right away, uh, Pramod to participate in, 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 these, uh, in these encounters and production of uh, 
uh, of, uh, of, of knowledge, of theories. And of course, we'll be having uh, publications in association with the Ecole du Louvre, uh, uh, the Institut National de l'Histoire de l'Art, History of Art, uh, and all these, these, these courses will be covered by the, the Saint Raphael Art Institute. We'll have a multilingual teaching. And I would like to say, and this is the first time ever for a Beaux-Arts school in France, it'll be in English. The first two years will be in English. Uh, but we'll be having an Alliance Francaise, most probably with us, uh, where the students who would be able even to live in the campus would have access to an Alliance Francaise to learn French while they're living here. But the courses, at least the two first years, will be 100% in, in English. So we are. Thank you. I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to kind of butt in uh, at this point, Ashok, yes. but we, I, I, you know, we'll have to, uh, you know, abruptly uh, close it uh, because we have two more speakers and I, I have yeah. to stick to time. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm no, I, I, it, no, it's perfect because I, I had finished. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashok. Thank you for letting us and uh, taking a peep into your Grand Projet, which is a big project that you're doing at the Saint Raphael Institute. As and, and I see that this is going to be a place where there is going to be a different kind of connoisseurship. It's going to be interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, looking at the ecosystem of a changing world where you're bringing in climate change and art together. And also being going to be very, very inclusive uh, without really, it's going to be sans frontier, without borders, because lots of people, you're going to collaborate with lots of people and that's what the future is going to be. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Ashok. And now I will invite Dr. Rima Huja to talk about uh, aspects and questions which have been thrown up in the connoisseurship, viewership and outreach of what you do and what are your visions for the future in this post-pandemic world. You have to unmute yourself. I know, I know, I had muted myself. So thank you very much again, Alka, and my thanks to the organizers of the Bihar Museum Binale for inviting me because it, every such occasion gives one a chance to think anew. Uh, I think there's something poetically symbolic in the fact that, can I have my presentation, please? Or shall I do it? Um, in the fact that I called it a tale of two museums or something. So coming straight after Paris, I think there is there is something in the title there. Uh, we can go with uh, the... Right. So I think what I am doing is giving a case study of two museums that I am associated with. Um, we can move on to the next one, please. And I have quite a few images, so I will try to be quick on this. Basically, uh, 20th uh, March 2020 changed the world in a different way. And as a historian, I don't know how I'll look back on it. And this is also the point where I say that I'm a museum person by kind of uh, evolution, default. Say what you will. I don't have the necessary training to be one. Uh, but I happen to be linked now with museums. And the, uh, the main thing, of course, was closure of the museums. And I will be talking of very briefly of the different nature of the two museums I'm focusing on. One is, of course, the Maharaja Savai Man Singh II Museum at the City Palace, which you have on your screen, uh, which uh, it's, it starts life in... Uh, 1959 as the Maharaja of Jaipur Museum, but it actually goes back several centuries and generations to a collection that the royal family of uh, Dundar put together. So in that sense, it's a continuity from the Amir days, and it's definitely over 300 years old in the building in which I'm sitting even now. Uh, in contrast, the other museum, and, and again, here is the connection we all have with each other. So promote Jaipur Virasat Foundation, when you were there, didn't have this folk music, music museum, but it does now. And this is something that became central to some of the work we've done in the last few years. But then again, came pandemic and life changed. Now, both museums have a different type of strength. Both of them, have limitations in the way we can and have dealt 
with the pandemic while uh, you know during 2020 and now that we are uh, starting a new uh, you know year on what happens so the next image please let me jump from there i i do want to say that uh, all right so in the case of jaipur the little red dot that you see in the middle of the wall city is uh, the city palace museum and the rest of it is the wall city so curfew meant the wall city being in cur under curfew museum is under curfew but it's really the, the heart of jaipur as it was meant to be was off limits to its own citizens i would need to thank ak roy and drona for using this image the late ak roy in his book but we go on to the next one one of the things i have learned is uh, that as i said this is when it was set up and we have these galleries and i have a very few images of them but we focused on the textiles and the arms uh, the 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 uh, diwane arm area which becomes the sabha nivas the diwane khas area which is a different building a painting and photography work we are doing on a transport gallery uh, the place where a lot of living traditional artists showcase their work which we call friends of the museum now all of this on paper this is what say one year and 17th of march 20s when we had to shut down so one year and a few days uh, earlier this is what we were talking about this is what we were uh, showing uh, this is what we were dealing with next we come to a state when can we have the next image so a lot of our outreach to students would be showing our textiles a lot of people around us a lot of school children coming in my colleague uh, showing people showing children some of the specialities of leheria and a traditional artifact the next one also next please uh, again this is technically not a please do touch no the yes this one but because they are children who were visually impaired for them it was a please do touch in other parts of the museum we have these things then we come to a situation next please next image that is what i was coming to work in from when unlock began in may there was nobody around we were there masked uh, not knowing what would happen and we were needing to basically find our way through this now to an extent being the equivalent of a, an executive officer i get to sign executive orders but i'm not taking the decision trustees do so some of the dis hard decisions that they were taking and some of the the lonely decisions or the lonely track that my colleagues and i had to tread this also meant our conservator could not come back to work a lot of our gallery people weren't there but more to the point we didn't have people to come in and see our collections we were not allowed by law this was still not open to the public and i do want to make the point here which i think most of you dealing with museums or with art and culture and i grew up with a sculptor and i didn't know how to see for a long time i was not i was looking but not seeing so i think that is what we were working on we would have people and we would try to get them to to view and not just look and go away but we had nobody to so the next imagery was next one thank you we have we have this fabulous collection next please and this is what we have the our new painting and photography or relatively new painting and photography gallery state of art you can't have anyone in next please so what we were able to do was say that the outside of this building is 300 years old there is enough for someone to come in and enjoy and enjoy not just what is inside the gallery but from the outside so initially we opened up a couple of the jaipur chatris which are part of the trust uh, where you could say you could social distance we had we had the right things to uh, sanitize yourselves wear mask we even had people wearing uh, gloves that we gave with the ticket and someone said what's going to happen we said they'll probably take it home because nobody's going to throw it away at least not here also opened up a fort the jagar fort which is way back in this image behind the the rajendra pole you can just about make out the low 
the hill, and behind that was Jaegar. So we opened not the gallery there also, just the building. However, I'm jumping the gun a little bit because until the 1st of August, we could not open the City Palace Museum to the public. We could and did open the Jaegar Fort from the 6th of, uh, of July. And we managed with that. And you know, it's still uh, an uphill task to have people wearing masks and things. But I, I'm again jumping the gun. I shall come back to that part. Uh, the next image, please. So one of the things we have focused on in this museum is use the online shops to talk about our printed, uh, what we've published. So, you know, the collection in print, at least enjoy that. Uh, we do not have a virtual tour of the museum, not for want of trying. I think it's more a question of uh, what the trustees feel they need to do with the collection. At this point, they are not in favor of opening up too much of the collection to, to uh, virtual tours. So that is a limitation. Uh, it's been uh, the next image, please. There's another of our books there. So again, this is one way. Now, the books obviously have not come out immediately. But in the long run, we will probably be using more of this. And my colleagues have some of these uh, in the pipeline, ready to you know press the button and we got a book at the other end almost. Uh, and we will be using a lot more of modern day technology for all this. We've had audio guides which people could not use even when the museum opened because you had to keep sanitizing the ear pads and all of that. So what we, we do with technology. I just want to see if there's another image or yes, there is. Next, please. So as I said, Jagar could open earlier and where it, there was enough clean, fresh air and we were able to say we had limited times at that point, nine to four, and then we kept increasing that. Another image of Jagar, I think three more, and then we move on to the next uh, museum that I talk about. Uh, next, please. So fabulous views, and we stressed on that. We said, come, you know, come and, come and kind of, not quite say come and picnic, but that was the implication. And this has been used by the local people to find their own things to look at. Uh, the next, please. We have this uh, very large cannon, supposed to be Asia's or the world's largest cannon, it hasn't been fired more than once, it seems, on wheels. And the next, the Jaivan. And the shed that houses it is the next image. So just to give you a scale, it's on one of the bastions. Now, uh, I think in the in the discussion, maybe I can talk a little more if necessary, if people do need to know. But the, what are we going to be doing with this fabulous material in the future? The material that is in the gallery and the material that, uh, or the views that you get, the physical buildings that are in themselves something to look at. Next, please. Thank you. So the, the, the garden there, which again is, uh, and the next. Thanks, let's have the next. Okay, now the Jaipur Virasat Foundation, which started off life in, uh, we go one back one, which started off life in 2002, is not just limited to Jaipur, but the museum I'm going to talk about is now in Jaipur. And this is the world that we were coming in from. This is one of the early images from when Jaipur Virasat Foundation and the Mehrangar Museum Trust in Jodhpur and other colleagues got together. We were having these fabulous music programs, the riff at the Jodhpur Mehrangar Fort. So the pre-social uh, distancing, pre-masking days. Next, uh, next one. Thanks. And that will show you the museum that we set up. It's a tiny museum in Jaipur, which has got like uh, the, the rust or the essence or the synthesis of what the music component part of the Jaipur Virasat's work had been. Jaipur Virasat's work has of course been larger, but I will not go into it. So one large hall in which we have Jaipur, no, Rajasthan, a map of Rajasthan. We have things that you can listen to from the different musicians. We have their group, their uh, communities on the walls. And the next image is, again, this had to physically close down because of government regulations. And this was, this is the outside. It's a fabulous space. We've used the outside for performances. And I think Pramod has been to see it. I don't know if 
Alka has. So Ashok, you have an open invitation, but all our viewers and listeners today, once things are normal, do come and see. So this outer space has been used for performances. But again, during lockdown, we could not. Next, please. What we could do is when it started, uh, so the colleague who said that they would be doing, as managing trustee, uh, uh, the job there was for me to say yes and no and not do the actual work. So I didn't, I didn't have anxiety about that. But they started off with Jaipur Virasat organizing different types of walks in and around Jaipur where we had social distancing, where we had local people coming and describing it. And um, the next image, please. So this was really a way of getting uh, our viewers, our uh, cheerleaders, everyone, or people we have not been in contact with in the past, come together to find out something more about Jaipur, to find out something more about heritage, to find a way of passing time during this period of unlock, and thereby linking them back to the music that you can listen to in the music museum. So this is one of our walks. They're looking at uh, traditional waterways and where the water would have found its own course. Uh, next, please. Of course, Jagar was also used for that. Uh, next image. Thank you. When we were reopening on the 7th of August, 3 p.m., this is, again, you've seen the image, but this is what was put out. And it was with a lot of distancing. It was with a lot of uh, so what we chose to do, or what my colleagues who took the journey on from there, next image please, chose to do was while we opened this, and you can see our sanitizer, uh, this is the outside as you step in, so a small hallway, next please, along with having the museum open at the small functions, an image of one of the smaller rooms, where we talked about the synthesis being made, um, of the different mu traditional music and the new music. Next image again, please. Were more and more of these walks. So Nahargarh, famous for the, uh, the water structure that is in the film Rangde Basanti, but famous in Jaipur anyway for a hangout place. Uh, they, they, they kind of distance, but when it comes to photography, people take their masks off. So this was one of the many activities that have happened between July and as we speak even today, uh, in some many in collaboration, which include, next image, which include collaboration done with walks in Delhi and even at Banaras. So that, that uh, collaboration and help. One of the events done with distancing sort of, as you can see, but there, there were groups that came in, were again using this performance space. Uh, it's a flexi space. The museum is always open when we are doing this. The next one. So here what we have to show is not something that is restricted to a gallery and therefore it can have a different sort of sharing, a different type of connoisseur being, uh, being coming into being and a different kind of outreach. So again, people dropping by, uh, you can see the, hear the musicians literally by sticking the earphones in your ear or more to the point by you taking it down on your own phones. And the next image, and we were, we've been combining these. So there have been walks, there have been inside, a talk on Kathak followed by a performance. They've been cycling trips to places to look at. Again, tying back to what we have, to our own archives. I'm almost through with this. Next image, please. Uh, and so I probably left out a million things to say, but we will have one quick round at the end. Now the way ahead two different museums, two different uh, ways in which those two could respond and have been responded. So we are charting the way ahead. We are all together charting the way ahead. We are all finding the way ahead. There will not be perfect answers. There will be, uh, there's a colleague uh, who is now in a different city. And I think is the, because having sat through a lot of the unlock phase one, where we, could not see each other other than over a mask, knows how difficult that period was taking a decision of what do you open, when do you open it, how can you even put out something on social media when 
you know, the trustees may have a different perspective and they are entitled to that perspective. It's, it's, it's a, a museum that is run by a private trust and not by the government, but then being subject to the laws of the government. So we can only open to an extent. If they impose night curfew, we can't do our night activities. The same sort of thing can be applied to the other museum, but there we chose to go because it was the museum, we made it free for that period. So there's been an outlay, but not an income for that period. It was a call to be taken. It is not an easy call to take in a larger museum, both at Jaegar, which is a large space to look after and maintain, or at the city palace where, you know, the sheer electricity and everything need, means that you need to be able to have an income. So we haven't had it. We've had an outlay. What the future holds is something we have to jointly work on. It's not something, I wish I had a magic wand. I wish we could hire back people we needed to let go temporarily. We did job sharing for them when we started again. You know, the trustees are very open to that. We said, okay, we, we have money just to pay one salary. Can we have three people back so that, you know, they can have their little sava rupiah, if not a paunch rupiah. Equipment. My maths is bad, but you get the general idea. So uh, responses, feedbacks, always open. We are sharing most of our work and anyone who's interested can please contact Dr. Alka Pandey will put you in touch with me and we can share more of, more of the work, both of the Jaipur Virasat Foundation's music museum and of the City Palace Museum or the Jagar Museum. And I look forward to hearing my other colleagues for now. So thank you for this opportunity once again. Thank you, Alka. Thank you, Reema, for that very, very insightful presentation and the way forward that you are thinking and what you did, how inclusive you were, how much of... Uh, you know, how people shared and how you are keeping alive the tale of two museums. Thank you very much. And of course, if we hear from anybody, we are definitely going to connect them with you. And uh, all I can say is all of us are together to make sure that culture uh, is still the driver for many things and it will bring pleasure and uplift our spirits, particularly in the difficult times that we are going through. And now to my friend Pramod, who has been working in a very, very deeply meticulous manner, archiving so much, and also out of his experience, curating a wonderful uh, set of uh, exhibitions, which he's done over the last many years. Pramod. Thank you, Dr. Pandey. And also to the wonderful people at the Bihar Museum by Nale who've been organizing this fantastic uh, event, have been keeping us all informed, updated. And if you could just start with the slides, please. I know we are we have paucity of time, and I would like to try and stick to that. Um, to, to be very honest, um, it's still a little brave to talk about a post-pandemic world because I'm concerned that we still are in a bit of a pandemic at this point. But however, across all of this, the only certainty that I seem to have. Uh, in most of our archiving work and our museum work is that people like stories, objects have histories and culture informs us. So the one thing that has come through clearly to us over the course of the last one year is that none of this exists in separate silos, but are necessarily an informed function of one another. Uh, in the first few weeks of the pandemic, as we were still negotiating with what was becoming an enforced uh, social distancing and as reality doubled down, our phones seemed largely to be the one window we had to the outside world that we so well knew. However, it took me some short while to learn of a community of people who ran museums and portals with images and stories and with audiences sometimes, but much larger than museums and organizations with infrastructures. Maybe have the first slide, please. So we're now looking at museums which exist only in ether, which only exist on the internet. And this was really one of my first learnings of the pandemic that how do these communities survive? What are these amazing um, people who've decided that they wanted to reach out to other communities? The first one on your, that you see on your screen, these are all Instagram museum accounts. It's called the Museum of Material Memory. They show the most remarkable objects and it's a submission based repository with more than 16,000 followers. Now, in the international context, 16,000 might seem very little, but in the Indian museum context, just to give you a 
um, sort of a parallel, the National Museum only has about 12,000 followers on its own account. Whereas if you go to the other image on the top right, the Brown history, that has something like 500,000 followers from across the world. And this is again, a South Asian history, which is retold by the vanquished. And it is a Canadian account run by a gentleman who runs, who lives in Canada, puts out histories of brown people, brown communities, Indians, other Asians who migrated and moved to other parts of the world. And the, and the final image that you see at the base of the screen is the Partition Museum. What is really important here is that the Partition Museum exists at the physical space as well, but they have taken the choice of trying to tell the stories that they cannot possibly show in the physical structure out to the world in different formats. So increasingly what I'm finding is that reaching out to communities, what we started out, what Alka wanted us to speak about, viewerships, financierships, outreach, how are you reaching out to other people? This idea came through very quickly to me when I looked at Instagram communities. May we have the next slide, please? However, at the other end of the spectrum, there are conventional institutions, and here I take the example of the Marangad Museum for a very particular reason from Jodhpur. Over the course of the year, I was asked to give a talk on gold, and my choice was to look at the collections of the Marangad Museum and to explore and give an entire storyline of how gold was permeated almost every aspect of Marangad's collection. Now, the sad part is that I've never actually worked on Mehran. I've never had, I've had the opportunity to go visit it for sure, but I've not really worked there. But that's when you realize that a well-oiled machinery, a well-oiled museum has all of its research either available online or published in several ways, or you have an incredible team who even during the pandemic and lockdown were very happy to share images and share information with me. So over the course of two weeks, it didn't take me too long to put my presentation together. So. The digital voyage that I had of a collection in a different way came through and I was able to communicate a third idea to a new audience in the pandemic. So wherever you have sorted organizations, wherever you've decided that there are digital journeys that you want to go on, there is most definitely a space, even in the pandemic world, to communicate and connect with organizations, with people, with institutions, with individuals, and to the larger mass base that come to us. Next, please. When we speak particularly of connoisseurship, I really wanted to highlight this one exhibition, which sadly, thanks to the pandemic, none of us in India could go visit. It comes to a close over the coming few weeks. This is the uh, tribute exhibition put forward by the Museum of Islamic Art at Qatar for the incredible connoisseurship of uh, Sheikh Saud Al Thani. The reason I bring up his name particularly is that Amongst the Islamic collections that he amassed and that today are housed in three of the world's most cutting edge museums, bulk of the artifacts are from the Indian subcontinent. You've got extraordinary treasures from all over the country. Uh, you've got them in the three museums and you also have the manuscripts and the books in the spectacular Qatar library. So the museum decided that they wanted to honor the um, to, to honor Sheikh Saud, who all of most of us knew, and his untimely demise meant that this show had to be put up, had to be brought out. And when people whose collections and stories were being explored couldn't reach, this I felt was one of the significant loss of connoisseurship that we had because you had a person who created a collection, you had a museum which put forward an exhibition but you could not have international audiences come visit this collection. And this had a lot of resonance to most of my Indian colleagues, my friends in, who work on South Asian material in museums and the academic world across the world. This to my mind is perhaps the most salient example of the museum cost of the pandemic. Next please. However, excitingly on a completely different note, private collectors have had this time in the pandemic to relook at their vaults, cupboards, storage facilities, and lo and behold, new treasures that we had no clue about have emerged. Many of these have reached out and we are now in a completely healthy space of having lots of scholars who can work on these collections over the next few years. These two images that you see here are from the extraordinary multi-volume Mysore Ramayan series from the early 19th century that is completely intact. Uh, the collection is now being studied. There is a young Kannada translator. We have a senior art historian. There is a plan for bringing out significant digital outreach and publications in a few years time. And this of course is one of the fewer, more happier stories emerging out of the pandemic. Can we have the next slide please? However, what happens to objects in museums which don't have interpretation, who don't have people uh, who are trying to tell you stories because 
either the visitor is not present in the museum or the ob object is in a locked space where nobody can access it. Who explains here the significance of Hanuman being depicted in the Narsinga, the open end of the trumpet. A casual visitor might think of this as a pretty depiction of a god on a temple ritual accessory. However, a more informed visitor would know that Hanuman is meant to signify wind being emitted from the trumpet. As most of us Hindus know, uh, call Hanuman as Pavan Putra Hanuman. However, who explains the intangible on the tangible to the audience? Are we as a museum doing enough to interpret salient stories in a pandemic world? Can we use technology perhaps to try and leverage the outreach? My understanding is that tentative steps to engage with the changing world was given a huge knock on the shins during the pandemic. The message is loud and clear, adapt, communicate, share, or, or you will soon be irrelevant. This is something that I really genuinely feel across museums. May we have the next slide, please? But let's also turn to who is also giving museums a run for its money. You cannot buy a major piece of art, no problem. You can get a much cheaper niche produced double brand value high fashion accessory that could even work as an art object. These Bharti Care Lady Dio handbags are perhaps the cheapest care artworks in the market. I mean, no criticism of the artist who is very much in sync with her times and understands brilliantly how to take her trademark Bindi artworks to a newer, younger audience. But can we in museums understand this? Not to dumb down, but to expand our viewership by bringing in people who otherwise don't even look at us. I mean, these are models that we really need to consider when we are reaching out to newer audiences. May we have the last slide, please? And finally, and most poignantly, I want to leave you with two images of the ethical behavior of museums. This well-known image of Hooper is a staple of many 19th century photography shows. In fact, his handwritten note says, deserving objects of gratuitous relief at the Madras famine. I mean, he considers and calls people objects. This image has been so dehumanized, but it's a standard and a staple in many 19th century photography shows. It brings about disgust, revulsion, and an acknowledgement of colonialism. However, may we have the next slide, please. What about this image? If this image, which occurs during the pandemic, becomes part of a museum exhibit in the next five years, will we be able to look at this and be able to consider this as an object? Do museums have ethical dilemmas and projects that we are talking about? Are we working on signals that objects send us silently that many in the room can read while others can't? Connoisseurship, viewership, outreach needs much more than clever strategies. It needs lateral thinking, it needs it now. And most importantly, we cannot wait for a new moment to reach out to people. We need to be able to move fast and we need to be able to connect people differently. And with that, I hope we can begin the conversation amongst all of us. Thank you. Um, much as I would love to have a conversation with, even with us, but I don't know when such interesting things are happening, time seems to fly. And we are already at 3 p.m. So we have another panel happening, but I suppose we could just start something right now amongst all of us and uh, see that how are we all going to, as Rima said, it's, it's a brave new world. And as Pramod said, we're still in the pandemic and Ashok is already thinking of the future and is already thinking of inclusions. So as a conclusion, what, would, what, what do you think, uh, where are we? Um, because uh, we have time just for one response and then we just finish it. I would say, if I may, uh, just two words. Uh, and again, congratulations to, to all of you fantastic promote the presentation and Rima it's uh, uh, I'm coming you invite <laughs> me to come soon uh, just two words uh, uh, Alka humanism solidarity humanism mm -hmm. solidarity that's what uh, is at stake and what can save us uh, mm -hmm. saving us meaning saving what we are talking about uh, mm -hmm. humanism and solidarity and I, I love the presentation of promote, of promote just now thank you Rima Yes, we are all looking for answers together. So we're going to continue to evolve and find them. And therefore, we, what we co will come out with will be a lot of a range of options. 
and then we can again pick and choose. And because we are looking, we're looking hard. I think it's going to be bright. Whatever comes up is going to be a bright future. Even out of the grimness of what's happened now, we can look for the pearl and maybe show the pearl or show, show a pebble. That's our choice. You know, pebble is beautiful. Pramod? I mean, I really feel that we need to share more. I need to feel that we need to connect more. And the pandemic has told us that we can't be islands to ourselves and that if we want the museum culture to remain, to uh, foster more encouraging and getting younger people in, we definitely need to be sharing and collaborating. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Reema. Thank you, Ashok. Thank you, Pramod. I think we all sign off with a sign of hope, humanism, solidarity, and inclusion, looking for solutions together. Thank you so much.